Monster Professor. Welcome to The Monster Professor, a show in which we discuss and explore monsters in literature, myth, film, games, folklore, theater, art, culture, and beyond. I'm your host, Josh Woods, author, editor, professor, and monster expert. Uh, Just two quick housekeeping items to note. One is I got to be a guest again on the Dice Geeks podcast and check them out at dicegeeks.com. Go to the little podcast thing in the menu. Matt Davids uh, runs a really cool show and website and well hub for all things tabletop role playing, game master DMing. And on that episode, um, one co- most recent one called Monster Archetypes, Golems, Typhon, and the Monster Professor, I share my so far unreleased ideas about monster archetypes. In fact, I make the argument that there are three monster archetypes, but it's still something I'm playing around with. I bounced it off of Matt Davids on that podcast, so go check that out. uh, See what you think about it. I haven't yet shared these in publications or on this show yet. Still working stuff out. Maybe you have some feedback for me or some criticism that'll help me work out those ideas. Um, And another is, if any... I, I want some help. Do any of you know how to get in touch with Alan Oppenheimer? He's a voice actor, and he, among his famous uh, roles, he did the voice for Skeletor in the original He-Man Masters of the Universe cartoon. If uh, I don't even know if, if he does anything anymore. It's been a few years since I think he's done any kind of events or like Comic-Con kind of things. I don't know if he does talks or interviews, but I really want to interview Skeletor. Like, I want him in the voice. I want to talk actually to Alan Oppenheimer as well, but then I want, I have questions for Skeletor himself and I want to hear the answers from Skeletor's own voice. Uh, but I don't know how to get in touch with him. I, I've failed so far. So if you can help me out, um, contact me through any through my website, through any social media platform, any way you can and tell me how, because I want to interview Skeletor, Alan Oppenheimer. Okay, so for today's episode, I get to talk again with Michael Chimmers. He's been on the podcast before. He's an expert in monsters in theater history. In fact, he wrote the book on it, (laughs) The Monster in Theater History, This Thing of Darkness. Turns out he's also a werewolf expert, and uh, he takes us on a tour from like the proto origins of what this werewolf thing is in stories and culture all the way up through uh, werewolf hunts and werewolf trials to modern day, just a few years ago, even in the United States of America. Uh, Well, I say even in U S might be the craziest place (laughs) left on the earth. So might be the only place you'd expect to see werewolves anyway. Um, some really cool stuff about werewolves, and he went on a werewolf hunt in Germany. Like, in real life, he went werewolf hunting uh, to some famous werewolf locations, some iconic ones where they still have werewolf celebrations. So he takes us through that whole journey. It's a really cool talk, and... He just now opened, or I say, I should say established, the first official academic university center for monster studies. As far as he knows, as far as I know, it's the only one to exist in the nation, maybe in the world, maybe in the galaxy, the very first official center for monster studies. This has just opened up um, after we, uh, just a few days ago, actually, In fact, I held off on releasing this podcast until we have the live website, and so now we do. So go check it out. It's The link's in the description of this episode. It's www.monsterstudies.ucsc.edu. 
and that's the uh, University of California, Santa Cruz. So monsterstudies.ucsc.edu. Check it out. And uh, at toward the end of the podcast, he kind of uh, reveals this and, and discusses the details. So I'll let him speak to the details of the Center for Monster Studies. Some really cool things going on. So I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Here is Michael Chimmers. We're going to go hunting werewolves. Well, first of all, it's a pleasure to have you back. So thanks so much for coming back on the Monster Professor, Michael Chemmers. It's my pleasure, Josh. Uh, big fan of the show and always happy to be on the show. Um, you know, our conversation last time w- was a blast for me. And, you know, I've heard from a lot of listeners who really enjoyed it as well. And so we kind of ended on this note of we haven't even scratched the surface of all the things we want to talk about. In fact, I guess so many of our episodes end up being like that. But uh, I was hoping to have you back someday because you've got a lot on your mind in the world of werewolves. And we've covered yeah. some before, but I, I don't think we've covered nearly enough. And, and I think you agree. And so I'm, I'm really oh, happy yeah. to have you back. And, and what do you say we, we jump into the world of werewolves? That's terrific because the werewolf is my personal favorite monster in terms of the fact that uh, what I mean by that is that it's the monster that scared me the most when I was a little kid and it's the monster that fascinates me the most now. You know what? That's the most common answer, by the way. I don't know, remember if I shared this with you, but of all my guests, I ask them, you know, which monster scared you as a kid or which one is your favorite? And far and away, like like more than, I don't know, one out of every two or three answers is the werewolf. And I don't know why. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, I can tell you why for me, you know. Yeah, why it's, for you? Well, I think that a lot, when we, when we, when you start getting into the psycho psychological underpinnings of why monsters work in culture, right? Um, you start to realize that, 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 that fear, well, Jeffrey Jerome Cohen in his monster theory, he says that fear and love or disgust and, and yearning are actually two sides of the same coin, psychologically speaking. Right. Yeah. So we, are attracted to the things that we fear, I, ironically, right? Paradoxically, we're attracted to the things that we fear. And I think that ultimately it's because we fear that we might be like them, right? That's the, one of the things is that, that attracts us to certain types of monsters is that we fear that we might be like those monsters. So in some way, the werewolf represents the untrammeled id, right? The, the expression of the deepest longings of the person that are normally um, diluted by the superego and by our, you know, notions of decency and communality and, and so on and so forth. But who would we be if we didn't have those? Who would we be if we didn't have checks on our behavior? Who's our true self? And for better or for worse, <laughs> it's it the bestial version of the self, I think, is a really good stand-in for what that might be like. Does that make sense? Yeah. Is that what attracted you? You know, I I hear the rumors about you. One rumor is that sometimes (laughs) you you dress up like a werewolf or maybe turn into one and just say you're dressing up. I don't really know when you teach classes. And another rumor, (laughs) first address that one before I hit you with another rumor. All right. I'll address this rumor. I'm not going to say whether I actually transform or whether I (laughs) I pretend to transform or actually what's the difference really. but uh, yes, it's true. I have a class that I teach at the University of California, Santa Cruz, every uh, winter quarter. I'm teaching it right now, actually. So when we're not in COVID lockdown, I do a, uh, a reading of a, a film, not a reading, but a viewing of a film. And the film is um, the uh, 2010 remake of The Wolfman, starring Benicio Del Toro and uh, Anthony Hopkins. And um, oh my gosh. Who is the... Yeah, I only remember Benicio. Uh, Benicio Del Toro, <laughs> Anthony Hopkins. Yeah, Anthony. Yeah. And the female lead is... 
We can find out real quick. <laughs> On the tip of my tongue, yeah. <laughs> um, we can put that in later. The female lead is blank, blank, blank. Okay. Um, <laughs> While I'm showing this, I, I stop it periodically to talk about what we're seeing on the screen. And each time uh, that I stop it, I have transformed a little bit further into a werewolf. And then finally, uh, when I've completely transformed, I kill my graduate students and disembowel them and, um, <laughs> and then run off howling into the night. And uh, yeah, it's become a bit of, a, of, a, of a, an event, I suppose you could say, at UCSC. And the students from previous quarters tend to come to, to witness that again. It's always a little different. Every time I do it, it's a little different. But I'm a theater <laughs> professor at the end of the day, you know, so performance is such a huge part of how I think about teaching and how I think about monsters uh, that I just, I can't resist doing that. I have to. Yeah. Uh, Emily Blunt. That, that's her. Emily Blunt. Blunt. <laughs> Emily Blunt. My and, God. And Who I a, love. And a, and, a, and, a biz, and a bizarre note of trivia that I just happen to have noticed in, in the world of cinema that it's, it's Benicio del Toro's second time playing a werewolf <laughs> or a wolf man mm. uh, because there was a fantastic and underrated movie called Big Top Pee Wee <laughs> one time in mm -hmm. which Pee Wee Herman has a circus fall on his farm after a tornado. And one of the circus freaks is a wolf man in the background and he barely gets, I don't even think he gets a single line. We were watching wow. this at one point, and my wife was like, that's Benicio Del Toro playing Wolfman. <laughs> no, it is not. They're not going to have Benicio Del Toro playing Wolfman years and years and years before in a peewee movie. It sure the hell was. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> so. Wow. That's amazing. Well, thank you for that awesome trivia, Josh. That's... <laughs> How about um, that? In uh, another rumor I heard. Yes, what other rumors have you heard about me? <laughs> I heard that you juggle fire just for fun. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do. This is, I can confirm this rumor to be true. I do juggle fire. Yeah. <laughs> just for fun. I'm not great at it. You know, I can juggle three torches and I'm pretty good with a, with a, a, a staff, a fire staff. Uh, but um, it's just for fun. Just for fun. So when they told you uh, don't play with fire and you thought play with fire, what a great idea. <laughs> exactly. That's what I heard. I heard play with fire. Sure. I'd be happy to do that. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I do love playing with fire. That's true. That's so, true. so maybe take us through, you know, so, some of your thoughts on werewolves throughout history or, or in folklore, or maybe some of your favorites. Where should we go with this werewolf thing? Oh my gosh. Well, the werewolf, you know, um, is actually one of the oldest monsters uh, that currently is still popular. You know, it's, um, I mean, a lot of monsters come in and out of fashion. You know, nobody worries about the Emphis Bena anymore or the Fir Darig. You know, those are, those are of their moment in time, you know. But the werewolf is one that's been with us um, in India and Europe since the beginning of recorded history. Um, so, for instance, the, uh, they mention it in Pausanias. Pausanias mentions in his second century travelogue description of Greece. Uh, he records a widespread belief that an Olympic boxing champion, Demarcus, spent 10 years as a wolf. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Uh, werewolf clans existed among the Thracians, the Greeks, the Dacians, the Romans, the Iranians, the Scythians, and the Mongolians all of whom used rituals or sacred intoxicants of various kinds uh, to induce transformations. Uh, and so, you know, the word soma, uh, that is the, you know, the intoxicating um, drink, soma, yeah. is actually a Sanskrit word. And in Iranian, it's translated as homa. And the Iranian word for the Persian word for uh, werewolf is homavarka. So oh. it's the wolf, the wolf that comes from the substance right? The wolf that comes from the, the drink. So, and then in, in Germany, of course, you've got uh, a fascination with werewolves that goes all the way to the Nazis um, and still persists in, uh, in, in Western Germany. I was there a couple of years ago and everything is named after wolves there. Wolfenbüttel, you know, every, they, they just love wolves. They're, you know, Wolfstadt and Wolf this and Wolf that. So, um, uh, and then in, in Scandinavia, everybody knows about the berserkers, right? Everybody yeah, knows about yeah. the, the berserker fighters. Well, berserk actually means bear shirt. 
And so they would put on these, uh, theoretically, I guess this is what we think would happen, is they would put on bearskin shirts and then they would become bears in battle and they would gain the ferocity of bears. And there was a wolf uh, group called the Ulfednar. Um, and you find that in the Ingling saga. Um, and they would don wolf skins and they would then become wolf-like in battle. So we actually have, and then of course you've got Romulus and Remus in Rome, uh, right, who had this uh, very intimate relationship with a she-wolf. The she-wolf suckled them as they were growing. And um, so you've got this, this fascination and this fetish, fetish, I can't say that fast, fetishization with wolves and with people transforming into wolves that goes back very, very, very far into our shared histories. Yeah, if you, you know, if you're finding that uh, both in Europe and in India, then then I think that's about all the evidence we need to go ahead and, and guess that the that the Indo-Europeans were into it, uh, you know, before yep. they split off from the Caucasus mountains. Um, and so that yeah. makes it deeply like prehistorically old, this fascination with wolves and and absolutely i guess, I guess yeah. one of my questions about it's like well why are wolves the thing that are catching on like why not why not bears or or mountain lions or something like i mean bears are pretty darn scary like why is it the wolf that is it the wolf that fascinates us not not just through centuries but millennia i don't know the answer to that i though. i have a i have a guess um, the Sanskrit word for wolf is, um, let me make sure I get this right, is um, uh, virkas, vrikas, vrikas, V-R-I-C-A-S, which translates as thief. And um, uh, I think that this is the reason why the werewolf, why, why wolves are considered thieves or why, the, why that same wolf, that same um, the concept of wolf and thief would be so emerges because uh, wolves and humans have the same prey, right? Like for instance, sheep, <laughs> yeah. right? So as humans occupy this position of apex predator and, uh, or, you know, whatever it is that we are, and we start herding sheep, the wolves are taking the sheep away from us. Right. And they're, and they're, um, they're quite clever about it. And so they, they steal our livestock so they become thieves. And uh, in early modern um, or even in pre-modern uh, Europe, wargus was another word for outlaw, right? So there's this, there's this legal connection, this, this concept of the wolf as being the, um, the miscreant, the one who does misdeeds. And so I think that it's because we competed, biologically, we competed for the same kinds of resources, right? And that makes the wolf particularly fascinating for us, right? In a way that maybe bears and mountain lions that we don't see as often, who don't come into our territory as often. You know, the wolf dares come into the territory of the human and kills humans sometimes, uh, which is also the case with bears and lions. And bears and lions are so fetishized, I think. Um, Tigers certainly are fetishized. Uh, and then in, in different parts of the world, you have in India, you have the Rakshasa, which is a, a, a were tiger. And in, um, in Africa, you have a were jackal. And in uh, South America, you have a were jaguars. And in um, uh, southwestern United States, you have were coyotes, the skinwalkers, right? So I think, you know, it's, it's, it has to do with whoever the top predator is in the neighborhood. Yeah, yeah, and and by the way, that rec, uh, I can't ever pronounce it. I always called it Rakasha, and I, I'm pretty sure that's way off. How did you say the Indian weird tiger's name again? I think it's Rakshasa. Yeah. Rakshasa. That I, I remember Rakshasa. one version of it. Rakshasa. It's its hands bent backward, or it folded its hands back. It had like human right. hands, but they were backward, and that always freaked me out <laughs> more than right, that, more the, than the fact you, it was a tiger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now that's how you can tell that that they're uh, uh, that they're rakshasas because their hands are on backwards. Yeah. <laughs> God. So. <laughs> um, yeah. So that makes that makes really good sense. I mean, we're we're gonna you know we have this 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 kind of like is somewhere. I mean, we, you can man's best friend dogs. Uh, you know the the running theory and the one that I think yeah. makes quite clear sense is we just we were around wolves so much since we 
we, you know, cover long distances like they do. We, we hang out in packs like they do. We had the same prey that eventually we just started befriending some of them and we have dogs, but so I guess we've yeah. been alongside these, these wolf things for so long that we, we start turning into them. <laughs> but I also noticed a lot of your examples yeah. were, 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 uh, were from, you know, moments of reported history. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned a few from, from myth or literature. Um, but, you know, when you, when you start looking at it, there, there might very well be more werewolves in the historical record than in literature, poems, songs, stories, um, you know, even oh, like yeah. that, even like that bail, you know, um, you bring up the berserkers, uh, th there are, you know, I, I don't know if I mentioned this on the show or not before, but I always found it fascinating. We do have historical records of a Beowulf. It just so happened to be one of sure. Roth Crocky's <laughs> actual werebears. <laughs> and so the historical mm -hmm. Beowulf is crazier than the legendary one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah. so, so what, so t if you don't mind, you know, and we're just kind of like, we're just kind of roaming around like a couple of wolves in this, in this conversation. I'm, I'm curious about I your thoughts of, of how many werewolves we have uh, in the historical record, or if any of them in particular stand out to you or any of their trials or cases uh, are on your mind. Well, I'm yes. Here. So Yes. One of the things that really fascinated me when I discovered this was, um, I, I think this was in um, this monumental work called The History of Witchcraft, uh, which is a, um, an anthropological study of magic in, in Europe in the Middle Ages. Um, and one of the things that I discovered, I say Middle Ages, but this is the Renaissance, um, is that there was a there was a tremendous uptick in trials of werewolves in the 15th and 16th centuries. And so that's pretty recent, right? I mean, that's Queen Elizabeth's yeah. time. That's, uh, you know, that's not that, that's not the ancient, you know, um, King Arthur times. This is, this is fairly recent. Um, huge uptick in werewolf trials. And they were all in a specific area in the, uh, on the border between France and Germany in the, um, the river valley, uh, the Rhine Valley, I think is what I hope I got that right. So I went there to check it out and I went with uh, a dear friend, uh, Florian Evers, who is also a werewolf scholar in Germany at the Free University of Berlin. And he and I went on a werewolf hunting ex expedition <laughs> in Westphalia. You're not yeah, joking. It was with a lot me, of fun. Are you? you really went. No, you really I'm, went no. to the heart of werewolves and went werewolf hunting. That is we so did. awesome. We did, and there are still some werewolves there, um, which I'll tell you about. But let me tell you what we found in the archives. So uh, there are still some archives there, church archives that have records of trials, you know, from from that period. And what we found is that um, there are all kinds of practices that were going on in Western Germany that had to do with magic and wolves and had to do with either people transforming into wolves or being able to communicate with wolves. And uh, it looked like a lot of these um, practices had to do with people coming up and saying to some farmer, hey, this is a lovely flock you have here. Uh, it sure would be a shame if some wolves came and got it. You should pay me and I will use my magical powers to, uh, to put a blessing over your flock so that the wolves won't come in. And the reason why I'm able to do this is because I have a deep connection with wolves. You know, I'm part wolf myself in a way and I have this connection. And so therefore I can cast this spell that will get the wolves to leave your flock alone, right? And so these wolf blessings uh, became a crime in, um, I mean, who knows how, how early this process happened. There's no beginning to it, right? I don't know when it started, but I know when it ended, um, when they, when they uh, started prosecuting people for it. And this was at the same period of time when, um, when there's this huge uptick in, in werewolf trials. This is, this is what's happening is people are being taken up for giving wolf blessings. Um, 
as well as for transforming into wolves and causing damage and things like that. And people are being arrested for this. And then they're taken up in front of a magistrate and convicted of it. And then either they have to pay a fine or they are burned at the stake or hung, uh, depending on how bad the crime is. Um, but they're really trying to crack down on this. And um, yeah, I'll let you react to what I just said, because there's, there's, there's a lot more to that uh, story, but that's what, I, that's what I discovered, that there were all kinds of wolf-related magical practices in Germany prior to, or running right up to the 16th century, when they were kind of all made to be crimes. Yeah, uh, what what I've um, heard about these like wolf blusters or, or some what is it like wolf siegen yeah. or, or something like that? The, yeah, um, you know I've yeah. I only yeah. recently came across that, and so now I'm wondering: Am I only coming across it because you did the research and published it? <laughs> is that is that how we know about <laughs> it? Because you did that? Um, Actually, no, I got this from, um, oh, I wish I had this book with me so that I could quote it, but there's a wonderful book called Werewolf Histories. Um, William de Blecourt is the author, is the editor of this book. I've got to check that out. Um, this is not a, a, um, a picture book, you know, for horror lovers. This is a real academic book uh, of history that's really, um, really deeply historical deeply serious about its work and there's a couple of essays in there that i think are just wonderful and this is really where i i found that first um uh, clues about the wolf signerai the the wolf blessers and uh and then i went then when i went there i found actual evidence in the historical archives that backs that up man that is so cool so you went werewolf hunting and you and you really found you really found him uh it just so happened to be on paper but then you if i felt like you just dropped a hint that you and they're still there and i gotta know more about that <laughs> so what do you mean by well, these werewolves are still there well so there was in uh the little town of bedburg which is a really cute little uh, village. It's actually two villages. Um, one of them is called Bedburg and the other one is called Altcaster or High Caster. And, or excuse me, Old Caster, Old Caster, not High. Alt is old, not High. Um, I don't speak German. <laughs> so um, I don't either. So you could these, have told me two, anything. <laughs> yeah. So these two towns are, um, are, are very close to one another. And, um, uh, there was a werewolf, a very famous werewolf in Bedburg called Peter Stumpf. And he was particularly interesting because um, after his trial, after he was taken up and tried and executed for being a werewolf, the pamphlet, a pamphlet was written about the trial. So it wasn't just some ordinary trial. It was a highly publicized trial. And the pamphlet was, uh, was um, translated into many languages. And one of them was English. And um, uh, it became a significant source for English uh, playwrights who were wanted to write about witchcraft and werewolfism at the time. And, um, and also for people who were writing about not just playwrights, that's how I got into it was through playwrights because I'm a theater scholar. But it turned out that there are a lot more uh, people who wanted to write about werewolfism and witchcraft. Um, it was a favorite topic of then King James the Sixth. Uh, of Scotland. He was the King of Scotland and he eventually became James I of England. But before he did, he wrote a book, I think this was in 1593, I want to say, called uh, Demonologia, Demonology, right? And he writes about werewolves, he writes about witches, um, and uh, he was quite interested in these. In fact, one might say obsessed uh, was James. And um, so during James's reign that we call the Jacobian period in English playwriting, there were several plays were written about werewolves and witches uh, because he had brought that interest along with him, right? And people wanted to respond to that. The players wanted to respond to that. So I, you know, I was backtracking some of these plays and I found this pamphlet from Peter Schumpf. So I decided to go to Bedburg to find out uh, what was going on there, right? And Josh, we had the weirdest adventure for the, the first thing that happened is nobody, when we got there, I, you know, people said to me, oh, you're an American. What are you doing here in this tiny little town of Bedburg? And I said, I'm here for the werewolf. And they said, 
there's no werewolves in Bedburg. And I said, yeah, no, there are. There are werewolves in Bedburg. And the people said, no, they're not. That's ridiculous. Why are you saying that? Why are you trying to spread bad rumors about our town? <laughs> and I had a conversation with, uh, I had a conversation with the, um, the concierge at my hotel. And uh, I said, I'm here. Also, you know, one of the reasons that, I, or one of the things I discovered in Bedburg was that every year there's a play that is put on. Uh, and in this play, they reenact the story of Peter Schnumpf. And so I really wanted to find out about that, right? That was really interesting. And there's also a, um, uh, a, a, a Werwolf Vanderbeg, which is a guided tour, a walking tour of Altkoster and Bedburg that shows you all the sites where Peter Stumpf had, uh, you know, where he was arrested and where he was seen transforming into a wolf and, you know, all these important places in a story. And there are plaques embedded in the walls around the city center of Bedburg that say, this is where Peter Stumpf was arrested, or this is where, you know, so <laughs> it's not as if it's a secret, right? <laughs> and I'm saying, I'm talking to the concierge and I'm like, I'm here for the werewolf. And he says, there's no werewolves in Bedburg. And I said, here's a flyer right here on the counter <laughs> of the hotel for the Vanderbeg, right? And he says, I've never seen that before in my life. I'm like, it's on your counter. I didn't put them here. <laughs> And so there's just that's, like open was, denial of the werewolf and it's all around them. Yes. So man, yeah. they, I, I just, I just kind of like, what's at the heart of this? Or are they, are they afraid that you're onto them? Is that what it is? That's what I would think if I saw this in a movie. <laughs> that's, that's exactly what we started to think. And oh. we were like, what have we struck on here? Because everywhere we went in Bedburg, people asked us what we were doing there. Cause it's very unusual. A couple of, couple of scholars one from berlin and the others from the united states you know and we were wearing suits and ties you know because we were trying to look professional and so people were like what are you doing here and we would tell them and they would say that's ridiculous there's no werewolves here that's ridiculous and so we went to the home the very beautiful home in altkoster of the man who write who writes and puts on this play about about peter stumpf um and I have a lot to say about this play. There's, there's a lot going on there. I have not yet published anything about this play, but um, they put it on every Halloween. And uh, they, so I, and he, he put on his werewolf costume for us and capered around a little bit to show us how he scares the children uh, <laughs> dressed as a werewolf. And so I said, well, we did it. We, we found a werewolf, <laughs> you know, right here in, in Westphalia, you know, there's still at least one. Yeah. And uh, uh, so I wrote to a friend, a friend of mine wrote to me that, that night on text and said, how's your werewolf hunting going? And I said, well, I found one. <laughs> <laughs> she said, you did? And I said, absolutely. She said, a real one? I said, as real as they get. <laughs> yeah. And she said, did you see him transform into a werewolf and back again? I said, absolutely. You know? And she said, well, what did he look like? I said, he looked like a, like a retired chemist from Munich. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, uh, that Peter, you know, I always pronounced it Peter Stump, but that was a very Americanization. <laughs> of the... Oh, that's the Anglicization of it. That's, that's how they pronounce it in England as well, Peter Stump. Okay, yeah, that, I mean, it was particularly, that, it was a particularly nasty set of crimes that he, he seemed... Uh, from what I hear anyway, maybe just under torture, but he seemed to uh, admit to quite, quite happily or something like that. Like he, he seemed to yeah. go into great gruesome detail of all these people. But, you know, you, you brought up several times before that, you know, what is really the difference between acting like a werewolf and, and being one? And you look at Peter Stump's crimes and you think, a uh, werewolf wasn't necessary for all that. That could just be a, an extremely brutal, incestuous, ca cannibalistic man. Uh, not that he wasn't yeah. also a werewolf, but he didn't. It was superfluous at that point. Like he's eating his son's brain and eating the fetuses out of out of women, pregnant women that he's murdered, and it's just it's yeah. horrible. And did, and did they finally execute him on Halloween? Uh, I don't know if they executed him on Halloween, um, but they did execute him for sure. And his wife, I think. Yeah. And, and I think his daughter. His daughter. 
uh, yeah, it was pretty, pretty brutal. And, you know, the, the, um, the pamphlet is what you're referring to, right? And it probably exaggerated a lot of these crimes. Um, and then there is also some town records that we found when we went to the, we went to the, the Ratskeller in the town and we found some town records of, of this event that had happened, which were not publicized. And those were a little bit more sedate. And then um, the playwright uh, slash werewolf that I was telling you about, he actually believes that the whole thing is just a contrivance because Peter Stumpf was a wealthy Protestant. Huh. And the Catholics uh, saw that this was a way to, um, that the Catholic authorities could exert influence over their, uh, over their communities was by persecuting uh, witches in particular. And so since werewolfism was a type of witchery, uh, they could persecute it in that fashion. So that if you could, if you could um, identify a person as a magical practitioner, suddenly you had carte blanche in how you wanted to prosecute them. In other, if there were just a, if he was just a murderer, then he would have been able to call witnesses in his own defense and he would have, you know, his lawyer couldn't be forced to testify against them and those kinds of things. But if he was a, a witch, then he, they could force his own lawyer to testify against him. They would, uh, they would accept the testimony of children or mad people. It was just a lot easier to prosecute people if they were accused of, of being witches. And they could also torture them, right? Of course. And uh, under torture, people tend to confess <laughs> to whatever it is that they're accused of. Yeah. Yeah, man. So do you have any idea if, if any, you know, you brought up, it was a werewolf, you know, the werewolf or lycanthropy or these, any form of this kind of uh, werewolf culture. It, it was a legal matter in, in many cases. And you're, and that's definitely one. Do you have any idea if, if these are still in the books anywhere in, in say first world countries? <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I don't know that that is the case. I imagine not. Um, although I did for this research that I did for my book, I did discover some modern day werewolf trials uh, or trials of people who in the past 10 years, really, who uh, either um, said that they committed their crimes while they had been transformed into a wolf um, or that they were trying to protect ordinary people from werewolves in, in part of, as part of their crimes. Um, so where was still this? Definitely... Where was this going on? Well, it may surprise you to note that one of these took place in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Florida. In Panama City, Florida. Yeah. In Panama City, Florida, there was a young woman who um, lured a, a young man who was romantically interested in her back to her house where um, three older men set on him and beat him to death and hit his body in a storm drain. And when she was questioned about it uh, in a, um, in a uh, jailhouse interview that was on TV, she said that she said, well, I don't feel any guilt about this because I'm basically a werewolf. You know, I'm a werewolf. I transform into a wolf. And, um, Interestingly enough, she then eventually went into the penal system and uh, came out a year later expressing tremendous regret and no longer saying that she was a werewolf. So to me, she sort of made the full transformation from a human being into a beast and then back into a human being. Huh. In Panama City, Florida, I may or may not have had a bout of being rather werewolf-like myself in the past. Maybe oh, it's that maybe it's something about that place. I don't know. But they used to also. I remember back in I don't know the '90s or so have these radio game shows where they would tell you a bit of weird news trivia, and you had to guess Florida or Germany. <laughs> and, and, we, <laughs> and we have accidentally gone from Germany to Florida <laughs> with this thing. So there's something. That's there. amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, you know, werewolves tend to congregate in, in certain places, I guess. <laughs> yeah. There was a lot of weird stuff that happened, though, around the uh, 2010s, uh, early 2010s. Um, crazy things happened. There was a, uh, a man from Arizona who traveled to Minnesota. Uh, and while he was there, he entered into what appeared to be initially a consensual sexual relationship with these two women who uh, tortured him and they tied him up and they, they put hundreds of cuts all over his body and they tried to summon werewolf spirits. 
And uh, that was that was strange. And they eventually let him go, and the police found him wandering the streets of Minneapolis, I think. And then he said, "Yeah, these women sort of basically kidnapped me and did werewolf sex magic on me." <laughs> so that's fun. That was in 2010, I think. Gosh, uh, there's more, but <laughs> there's there's still around, and and I think. I don't know where you, you'd, you'd mentioned that, you know, when, when you're being tortured, you, you tend to just admit to anything they you feel like they're wanting to you to admit and more just because you're being, Definitely. being yeah. tortured. And, and I, and I remember hearing one tale of a Latvian guy, cause you know, the Latvians are, 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 are a crazy, a strong, powerful group, I guess. So two of my favorite uh, strong men are, are Latvians and, and uh, there were, I remember hearing about one werewolf trial in which they brought this guy up. They accused him of being a werewolf. He said, yes, I do turn into a werewolf, but it's yeah. only to go down into hell with my gang of werewolves three times yes. a year and to fight wizards yes. and witches that serve the devil right. to keep them cold. And then we come back up. So we're werewolves fighting against Satan. I thought, man, oh man, this sounds like a yeah. album cover for Dio. <laughs> Something like this, like a gang, no, right. gang of werewolves <laughs> fighting Satan, sorcerers and witches. Uh, and he, and they, yeah, I know that. they tried I know that story. Yeah. Didn't, didn't they just like end up, if they tried to get him to admit that no he serves satan rather than fights him and he wouldn't do it so they just gave him a whipping yeah. and called it a day <laughs> like he didn't, he didn't yeah, yeah that's right the benandanti i think is what those werewolves are called the benandanti werewolves yeah the good walkers right yeah yeah um yeah man that's cool so we still have this going on gosh Oh, um, maybe I can yeah. make me, I can, th- since you've been there, since you've been werewolf hunting, did you take any silver with you? Or maybe the bigger question is, yeah, is there any reliable way to fight or kill a werewolf? Well, um, I did not take any silver with me because I uh, wasn't interested in hurting the werewolves. I was interested in finding out as much as I could about them. Um, you know, so, um, you know, Byron one time, Lord Byron was asked about vampires and he said, the, the, the small acquaintance that I have with vampires does not induce me to give up their secrets. (laughs) I like that. Uh, (laughs) And something like that anyway, it's probably a wrong quote, but, um, (laughs) uh, so I, but I felt like. I wanted to get the werewolves out of the shadows and really see if I could figure out what's really going on. Um, And so I didn't bring any silver with me. I have no interest in hurting werewolves. I'm interested in learning about them. So if there are any werewolves listening to this show, and I expect there are, uh, please, you know, shoot me an email at chemers at ucsc.edu. And um, we'll tell your story. You heard it here, folks. <laughs> if, if you're if you're if you listen to the Monster Professor, because you yourself are a monster, you've got somebody looking out for you. Someone <laughs> wants to find out more about your story, and so That's right. who knows? I have a lot of listeners in uh, in Europe, Eastern Europe, and that sounds like they they congregate around that area. So we might actually have some werewolves listening right they now. Do, they do, yeah. Eastern Europe is another place where you find a a lot of werewolves. Definitely. Yeah. So maybe since, you know, maybe we can pull on some of your, you know, theater expertise or storytelling expertise, um, you know, being aware of storytelling, especially theatrical stories throughout time. And you can perhaps correct me or answer me on this wonder I've had for, for, I don't know, as long as I can remember, you know, as a, as a kid, I've, getting turning my love of monsters into a literary love of monsters and reading Dracula and reading Frankenstein and, and getting into all these tales and, and watching every movie I could of monsters. And it just felt like there was no iconic werewolf tale or werewolf story. I mean, there there are some common threads among them, but you know, with something like we have an iconic vampire tale, you know, of this, you know, a uh, you've got this vampire, this old vampire in a, in a distant land in an old castle. And, 
and the realtor wants to bring him over, brings him over, and then he's preying on the right. women, and you got to fight him and chase him down, and and you just no matter how you how many different ways you tell vampire stories, we're still kind of drawing from that the one that got iconic, but it just never felt like we had an iconic one. Even the Universal Studios Wolfman tale just didn't seem to have anything to hold on to really. Um, or, or what was that iconic tell at its heart other than there was a werewolf in it? Um, am, am I right in, in noticing that it doesn't feel like we have the iconic werewolf tale? And if so, why not? Or if I'm wrong, what is our iconic werewolf tale? Uh, no, I think you're right. I think, you know, there is an uber telling of Frankenstein. Uh, or at least we think there is, right? It actually turns out that it's far more complicated than that. And there's an uber telling of the vampire story, which is Dracula. Everybody knows Dracula. Not everybody knows that werewolves, I mean, excuse me, that vampires were uh, a dominant image in um, French and and English writing for a hundred years prior to uh, Bram Stoker writing Dracula. Um, Nor that the, 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 the legend of vampires goes back to the probably to the 14th century in Eastern Europe. Um, I don't know of a Uber version or an Ur version of, of the werewolf story. I think uh, we just have, we have a lot of different versions of it. And I think maybe, I, I mean, I don't I, I hate to speculate as to why that is the case. Um, Dracula just really caught the imagination, you know? Um, and so did Frankenstein. They were perfect for the modern age somehow. And uh, those were both, Frankenstein and Dracula were both, or the vampire anyways, prior to Dracula, but they were both uh, made into um, lots of plays. This is before television and film. They were made into lots and lots of plays that were immensely popular all over Europe and in, later in the Americas. And the werewolf doesn't appear in plays as much as, as often. I'm not exactly sure why or at least I haven't found it. And so if anybody out there knows of werewolf plays from the 19th century, I would really love to read them um, because I just haven't been able to find them. Uh, I don't, I don't know why that is the case though, Josh. I just, I don't know. I know it is the case, but I don't know why. Yeah. And I, I mean, I guess we're, you know, the, the themes that you've already, you know, explained earlier on about this, you know, the release of the id, uh, you know, and these, Every every werewolf tale seems to to get at that, and I guess maybe there's like one narrative, like plot beat or element in that. I guess that's as old as as the Petronius uh, story with the Roman soldier is, is you know you wound the thing in its wolf form, and then that's how you like right. detectivize or detect, but you know at play the detective, and, and find out who was the werewolf, but that's not that's not much to go on so i don't know maybe no. maybe we need to tell that tale <laughs> we need to create the iconic werewolf maybe. story I don't know. but i mean it's like you said you know there are, um there are other stories uh there's an arthurian story um called gorlagon gormagon oh my gosh i can't believe i don't remember this but there's a werewolf in 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 this arthurian tale uh, who um, is a good guy, more or less a good guy, right? So I just, there's just a, a, a greater diversity of possibilities, I suppose, for werewolves, which, does, which makes sense in a way because werewolves are very prodigious, right? They're very alive and they're very, they're constantly transforming, right? So um, maybe, it's an, maybe it's a mistake to try to pin it down to an Ur story. Or we could write one, you and I, Josh, we could write a version of this and then make a, a million of, of those Earth dollars that I'm always hearing so much about. <laughs> Let's do it. Maybe we should do it. Let's do it. So, and, okay. um, you know, I've, my, my God, I, only, I almost have you here for an hour. Maybe, maybe we should, you know, find wow. out a little bit of, of what you've been up to. Last, last we talked, you were, you were exploring this possibility of, of, of taking your monster studies all the way to de- the development of a, of a center for monster studies. Yeah. You've got a class going on. So, ma- so maybe you can uh, catch us up on what, what Michael Chimmers has been up to, and especially if it oh, relates to monsters and, and where can people find out more about you? Yes. Oh my gosh, Josh, if, if we had just waited one day, I would have launched the website 
for the Center for Monster Studies. No kidding? But yes. The, yeah, the Center for Monster Studies is a thing. We got a bunch of money. And I don't know how we did it, but people are really interested in this. And <laughs> people are willing to support it and want to become part of our family. We, have a, um, we now have a, a consortium, uh, a research cluster of professors from all over many different parts of the, of the university here at the University of California, Santa Cruz, from the arts, from the humanities, from engineering, from social sciences who are interested in this. And uh, we're all collaborating now in a, in a giant research cluster that is associated with this thing called the Center for Monster Studies. And we are gonna put on a festival of monsters and uh, we're gonna do that annually. We did one in 2019, uh, but COVID has prevented us from doing it this year. And uh, I think nobody wants to go to another Zoom conference. So we're gonna wait until we're all vaccinated and we can get back in the, back in the actual place. Um, but we are, we are developing uh, a number of uh, very cool enterprises, including a podcast, which provisionally is called This Thing of Darkness, which I've already recorded two episodes of. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, we also are developing a monster curriculum so that if students coming into the campus want to get as many monsters classes as they can, there's a list of the monster courses that are offered by UCSC. We're developing that. Uh, we're looking at some big grants from the NEH and uh, from some other areas to really to really get in and pursue this. And hopefully, when we do the Festival of Monsters, that'll attract a lot of people. We'll have we'll have some amazing people come in and 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 be lecturers, uh, or you know, give a master class or something about what they're doing, or to be part of the conference. Um, so that's there's a lot of a lot a lot is going on for sure. That is awesome. Uh, the man. Center for Monster Studies. Yeah. And you, Thanks, man. It's a thing. The, and, and you said this is, uh, you know, that's going to go live soon. Uh, I think by the time, you know, listeners are hearing uh, this, then we can, we can have links uh, to the site uh, and those kinds of things up and going in the description. That would be, that would be great, Josh. Well, this, that, is, that is fantastic, man. Uh, congratulations yeah. and or thank you for, for putting some, strapping some rockets on the back of, the, of Monster Studies and really getting it going. I mean, will yours be, do you know if yours will be the first or the flagship center for Monster Studies in the U.S. that we have? To the best of my knowledge, this is the first center for Monster Studies anywhere. Uh, this is the first enterprise of its kind anywhere in the world. That is so cool. So, it's just people are really starting to recognize the benefits of taking monsters seriously and, and really thinking about the impacts and what, what it means to be a monster culture, which we are. Well, man, this is, this has been fantastic. I, I, I've learned a lot. You've been really generous with your time again, and I'm, I'm left, even oh. though we're about a, an hour into it, um, I, I'm still left feeling like we barely scratched the surface of all the things we could talk about, even about just this one monster. <laughs> I don't know how you feel, but I've really enjoyed it. Oh, absolutely. I have a lot more to say about werewolves. I mean, we didn't even get into the uh, the transformation of werewolfism from a piece of witchcraft into a piece of mental illness. Um, and uh, I mean, there's so much more to say. Absolutely. So just, uh, you know, if you would have me on again, I would be delighted to come. Let's, let's do, let's do it. Let's, uh, let's put a pen in that or a rain check on that. And after the, after you've got uh, the Center for Monster Studies hot and rolling and uh, we've got some events coming up, maybe we can further promote that and dig back into werewolves and all sorts of monsters we're getting into. How's that sound? That sounds great. That sounds wonderful. Thank you, Josh. All right. Well, thanks again. It's been a blast. I know uh, listeners are going to love it as much as I have, I think. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure to come on The Monster Professor. 